I podcast is returned. Robert Evans behind the bastards. Jim Baker part two. Vic Berger guest. Hello. Hello. Hello how hello. are how are Vic? How are oh, I? Just wonderful. That's good. That's good. I I am experimenting with using less words than normal uh, <laughs> in in the hopes that that will make me easier to understand. So, right. how's that yeah, going that for you, buddy? Yeah, is that working? Poorly, out? yeah, poorly. <laughs> it doesn't doesn't work well. Um, but you know what was working great in the 1980s was Jim Baker's grift. Fucking, he's really hitting it out of the goddamn yeah, park it's in the, of the 80s. Game. Yeah, 1987 would prove to be the high point for Jim and Tammy Baker's empire of, you know, whatever you want to call it. That year opened with PTL breaking ground on the Crystal Palace Ministry Center, a hundred million dollar construction project. So that's um, they have expanded quite a bit at this point. Um, now, and this Crystal- is uh, I'm sorry, where where is this again at the time? What the what state heritage is USA? It's in, the, I think, South Carolina, South Carolina. OK, yeah. Uh, so the the Crystal Palace Ministry Center was supposed to be like the palace itself was a gargantuan glass structure, 916 feet long and 420 feet wide. Uh, it was a full scale like representation of like a Victorian era building from London. Uh, it would have a 300 seat auditorium and a 5000 seat TV studio. Um, Jim Baker bragged to everyone who'd listened that when complete, the Crystal Palace would be the largest church on Earth. Uh, so that's awesome. <laughs> wow. Yeah. By 1986, PTL had more than 2,500 employees and revenue of more than $125 million per year. The Heritage USA theme park was hugely popular. More than 6 million people visited it that year. Uh, and again, only Disneyland and Disney World were more popular. So on the mm-hmm. surface, it's not crazy that they would embark on a $100 million construction project, right? Sure. That seems you know pretty easily within their means. Um, and yet, on the very day that ground was broken for the Crystal Palace, Tammy Faye Baker suffered a calamitous mental breakdown. Now, when it came to popularity outside of the evangelical Christian bubble, Tammy Faye definitely outshone her husband. Her heavy makeup and regular crying fits that sent it running down her face were regular subjects for parody. Like, Bloom County made a lot of Tammy Faye Baker jokes. Right, but on yeah, that... I, jan- remember huh? Phil Hartman did... Uh, yeah. Phil Hartman, yeah. On SNL. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he did a great Sammy Faye. Like mm-hmm. she, that she's definitely like the one who kind of cracked into the mainstream the most, right? Um, but the hysterics were not like just something she did for the camera or anything. Like it was, she had serious emotional regulation problems, in part as a result of the stress of running a business that was constantly on the edge of collapse because of the financial crimes they were committing. <laughs> um, that's not great for your. Uh, you it's just just not great um and so on that january day uh she had a mental breakdown and as don hardister the former ptl head of security later recalled quote they left me in the house alone with tammy and that's when she started hallucinating and i couldn't believe i'm there by myself with this lady and she'd taken her clothes off and tammy didn't do that kind of stuff around me we all knew she had some prescription drug problems so she's is a bad Uh, breakdown and two months later tammy's problem grew serious enough that she required treatment for chemical dependency uh as had become the norm, the Bakers took to the airwaves and recorded a whole very special episode about Tammy Faye's battle with drug abuse. And again, this went over well with their audience. Like, the fact that Tammy had been abusing narcotics, like, didn't slow the donations down at all or make them any less bluffed by their, their right, viewers. Right, yeah. it's just, You see their their faults and uh, you know, yeah. they wanna, and they want to help. They want to help, mm-hmm. uh, help her problem. Exactly. What didn't go over well with the audience was a blockbuster article in the Charlotte Observer published just days later revealing the sordid details of the rape that Jim Baker had committed on Jessica Hahn. Mm. So that comes out in 87 too. And while this is happening, the Observer continued to tear into Baker's ministry for its flagrant misuse of funds. They published more more than 600 stories in 1987 alone. Um, so they are... Wait, 600? Te- yeah, <laughs> oh they God. are fucking tearing into this. <laughs> yeah, the Charlotte Observer once 
this stopped and they put in the <laughs> fucking groundwork okay. uh, and they revealed this massive chain of fraudulent fundraising, fake lifetime memberships, incorrect tax exemptions based on its status as a nonprofit religious organization. Um, it's revealed that the FCC actually launched an investigation into PTL back in 1979, over $300,000 in funds raised for missionary work overseas that was just spent on the theme park instead. Um, <laughs> and it becomes kind of clear that the theme park has been losing money for a while because it's just so fucking expensive and all of these things that he keeps adding to it are so ambitious um so they're like raising money for other things and then spending them on this theme park because fucking jim baker loves his stupid theme park um <laughs> it's pretty cool so uh jim raised huge amounts of money for overseas ministries and his followers you know donated that money in the hopes that he'd send out preachers and provide humanitarian aid to impoverished areas instead he rerouted millions of dollars of this money and pumped up his uh theme park yeah uh, so the park bled millions a year, uh, and much of Jim's criminal behavior was dedicated to plugging that hole. In 1988, he was indicted on eight counts of mail fraud, 15 counts of wire fraud, and one count of conspiracy to commit fraud. Between this and the big reveal that Baker had spent another $265,000 of church money bribing his rape victim, there was no way for Jim and Tammy to stay at the head of the PTL. So everything falls apart very fucking quick. <sighs> so we have found the line here, though. This is where it hits. All right. <laughs> So that's good that there's a line. Um, this this proves to not be something that you can like uh, get on TV and be like, hey, uh, uh, fucking, uh, this is what I did and it's fine because I'm giving myself up to God. That that there mm. there is a line to how there much you can do that, right? Yeah, or at least there was. <laughs> Our old friend Jerry Falwell sailed into the gap to take over the ministry and try to right the ship. Uh, and if he thought doing this would be an easy way to turn a dime, he was very, very wrong. It quickly became clear that due to Jim's criminal mismanagement, the ministry owed nearly $100 million to various creditors and more than $55 million in back taxes. Mm -hmm. Falwell resigned less than a year later and accused Jim Baker of being, quote, probably the greatest scab and a cancer on the face of Christianity in 2,000 years of church history. Oh, my God. Like, there's some <laughs> there, genocides yeah. in there. And he's Seriously. like, no. <laughs> Jim's there's words. a there's a there's a good clip of Falwell just before all that where he uh, they're like seventy million dollars in debt and he he raised a goal if he, they wanted to get twenty two million in a month he would go down Jesus the water he would go down the water slide um, in yeah. his suit yeah <laughs> so, and they raised that money and and he went down the slide in his suit yeah <laughs> it's amazing yeah, it, it, it's a, Twenty two million dollars. Imagine asking yeah, people to do that. It's so it's so good. It, yeah. <laughs> it's good and cool. So mm -hmm. Jim Baker was quick to tell the New York Times that without a miracle of God, we will never minister again. But it was clear to every rational observer that he and Tammy had just stepped back from the flaming wreckage of their ministry to wait out for the inherent forgiveness of the well-meaning rubes who supported them. Alas for Jim, he would have to weather a massive criminal trial before this could happen. Tammy Faye escaped indictment, and there's a great debate to this day as to how much she actually knew. It's probably fair to say she was more or less an equal partner and was fully aware of the enormous intercontinental scam that paid for her houseboats and fur coats. But she escaped without legal consequences, and her husband was not so lucky. Uh, their former employees rolled on him pretty much instantly. Steve Nelson, a PTL employee who was responsible for the lifetime membership program, testified in court that memberships had been deliberately oversold. The act of betraying his boss and God to a court of law was more than the old man's constitution could take, and he collapsed on the stand. As the court wow. sketch artist later recalled, when he fainted, it was this silence, and a voice from the audience came up and said, Oh, he's giving his life to God. And Baker's <laughs> attorney called him up and said, Jim, Jim, as if there's going to be a miracle, he can bring him back to life. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sounds like a fun court case. Real good time. Nelson was not dead, though, and as the trial continued, Jim Baker had a complete mental breakdown himself the very next day. He began hallucinating that the reporters outside the courtroom were insects. His... <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, his head of security recalled later that night, he was curled up underneath his attorney's couch. I think the weight of that trial and the weight of everything he had done, good and bad, just crushed him. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> right. Yeah, well... I would hope so. Well, yeah, what do you, what do you think's going to happen? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so Baker was committed to a psychiatric ward in the federal prison, and the trial was put on hold for six days. When things finally concluded on October 5th, 1989, Jim was found guilty on all 24 counts and sentenced to 45 years in prison. He was also ordered to pay a half a million dollar fine. He appealed, but the court withheld his conviction. They did grant him a sentence reduction hearing, though, and dropped those 45 years down to just eight. And he only actually served five before being paroled in 1994. So that's great. Yeah, five years. Steal millions of dollars, rape a woman, five years. Right, right. And back out In a minimum security prison, yeah. (laughs) And his cellmate was Lyndon LaRouche. (laughs) (laughs) It's so good. Oh, boy. So... Alas for Tim, Tammy Faye was not a waiter. She filed for divorce while he was in the clink and married a guy named Roe Messner, a contractor who'd helped to build Heritage USA. Tammy knew how to pick him. In 1996, Messner was convicted to 27 months in federal prison for bankruptcy fraud. So, mm. <laughs> yeah. there we go. And weirdly yeah. enough, Tammy Faye dies in, I think, 2007. She gets cancer. But she, mm. her second act is actually kind of sweet. Like, she becomes, for purely... For purely ironic reasons, she becomes a gay icon because of her, mm-hmm. like, makeup and everything. Like, she's seen as right. this, like, yeah, like, a lot of, like, drag queens and people like that will, like, want to, will, like, emulate her makeup style right. just because it's, like, so garish and out there and kitschy. Yeah, my first uh, exposure to her was when she was on uh, that VH1 reality show, The Surreal Life. Yeah. Do you remember that with uh, yeah. Sherman Helmsley <laughs> and the, the guy from Smash Mouth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> And she, um, you know, she, I mean, she'd said horrible things at, as had her husband about gay people and PTL. And I don't think she ever like came out and just said like I was wrong. But she uh-huh. did state later in life that like when everything collapsed for her, the only people who were there for her was the gay community because they, right. yeah. yeah. So that's interesting, Tammy. Yeah. I don't know what to say about Tammy Faye Baker. She's an interesting person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, uh, once he was out of minimum security prison, Jim Baker wound up briefly in a halfway house. Before his fall from grace, he'd owned a 55-foot houseboat, a $55,000 Rolls Royce, and a $45,000 Mercedes Benz, along with numerous palatial mansions all around the world. Afterwards, he wound up living in a rented farmhouse in North Carolina. There, Jim began to execute an epic plan to rebuild his empire. It started with the publication of his second autobiography, titled, I Was Wrong. Which is at least a better title than If I Did It. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. yeah. In it, he seemed to repudiate the prosperity gospel beliefs that had dominated his first ministry. He wrote, I was appalled that I could have been so wrong, and I was deeply grateful that God had not struck me dead as a false prophet. So, that's interesting. Um, yeah. it, the book was step one. Uh, but if Jim was going to c- c- achieve his goal, which was to just do the same thing he'd done before a second time, uh, he knew he was going to need to sell himself to a new community, a community open-minded enough to forgive someone like him. He found this community in Los Angeles, California, at a place called the International Dream Center. And according to the Washington Post, quote, There he lived in a cramped and crumbling room with his son Jamie, 22, and received visiting reporters eager to chronicle his recovery. All the glowing articles about the new Jim Baker mentioned his rough life in the ghetto, including the cramped room. (laughs) And, yeah, so Jim throws himself on the mercy of the black evangelical Christian community. Like, that's who he goes to when his chips are down. And as surprising as it might seem, they took him in. Uh, Some of this had to do with the fact that, as I stated, PTL had been very popular with the black community, and the Bakers had Mm -hmm. always been relatively good on racial issues. Um, So many of the folks that he reached out to in L.A. remembered him from their childhood. But as the Post's reporting continues, that's not the only reason he was accepted. Baker's story of temptation, collapse, prison, and loss resonated with many poor black folks in L.A. You know, this is Mm -hmm. obviously Jim's actual experience of of crime in prison had uh, no similarity. But, (laughs) you know, he was good at spinning it. Um, They they, at one point, like when he was doing this sort of revival tour, they interviewed a number of the folks who were in line to buy his book in L.A. And I want to quote from that now. Mm. One of them is his former cellmate at Jessup, Nathaniel Mathis, 32, now working at a telephone company who showed up to wish his friend well. I can relate so much to him, how he was stripped of everything, Mathis says. Like Jim, I lost everything, 110%, but the Lord works in the lowest valleys. 
Lawrence Drew and his friends are all black men in their 20s, just out of prison on drug-related or similar charges. In four hours, they have to show up at a janitorial job for Manpower for Jesus, their halfway house alternative. All are hopeful that their lives will soon change, and they look to Backer for inspiration. Oh, sure, all of us can relate to him, says Drew, who has just paid $25 for Baker's book and is waiting patiently to have it signed. He's the underdog, and that's what we are, underdogs. He's real. He's very real. And now, by which he means after the prison term, I think he can be more powerful than he ever was. Ooh. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's not what you'd guess, right? <laughs> right, right. What What is going on there? What is like that mindset to, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah, it's people will just talk. Like, yeah, just for like just ignoring exactly what what he did. It's, I mean, just like obviously, it's like like the MAGA folks today are just exactly. It's yeah. the same mindset. Like, yeah, whatever. You know, it's, you know, he's he's fighting for us. I guess I, I don't I don't know. I don't understand it. Yeah, I. It's hard to understand. Some of it is just that, like, as a general rule, the 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 black Christian community is considered to be is 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 extremely forgiving. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it like a number of prominent figures in uh, the American history have like after doing something bad, like shown up at like a a black church and given a speech or something and like, Mm -hmm. you know, done the the mea culpa there because it's kind of a good place to do it. Um, And there's a lot of complex reasons for that that I don't feel competent to get into. But it's like Mm -hmm. it is a trend, particularly for like white people who do something really bad. Uh Um, Like I'm going to wipe this away by. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's a thing that happens. Um, yeah. So that's good. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Now, one of the things, ironically, that helped Jim Baker in crafting his act, too, was the fact that he'd never been a very good preacher in the theological sense. All of his sermons and ideas were just cribbed from more original thinkers, people like Oral Roberts. It was hard for him to come up with much on his own because Jim had dropped out of Bible college and never quite finished reading the Bible. Um, and it, it would seem... To me, that this would be a bad thing to reveal after you've spent 30 years as like a, an expert on Christianity. Mm-hmm. But Baker leaned into this successfully and he flipped it into a positive because now he could start claiming that he'd learned the Bible in prison mm-hmm. um, and that like that taught him more about his faith than than Bible college. And this is how right. he starts to claim like this is how he learns prosperity gospels wrong as while he's in prison. He gets to really focus on the Bible for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> It's an amazing grift. It's an amazing grift. Uh, <laughs> from the Washington Post, quote, He learned above all that the meek shall inherit the earth, that his 40-room mansion and air-conditioned doghouse and 12 cars were part of an ungodly, arrogant lifestyle, a realization he came to a few months after he was initially denied parole. I believe, the Bible said, above all, God wants you to prosper. Well, when I went to prison, I began to study the Bible, and I realized that Jesus Christ didn't have anything good to say about money, he says in his sermon. He called money the deceitfulness of riches. He said, woe unto the rich. And this plays really well to a crowd of poor black people in LA and it's just it's amazing that this is coming from this fucking guy's mouth but it it works it's it's something else (laughs) I don't I don't understand I, I don't know that I ever will if guys like Jim Baker are grifting on easy mode or if he's like the fucking if he's just that good it's impossible for me to really tell um but it works yeah Yeah. (laughs) yeah so jim reinvents himself as a humbled man preaching the word of god from the position of a sinner he talked about the little log cabin where he lived now which was really a seventeen thousand square foot home lent to him by a wealthy follower (laughs) Uh, (laughs) and he met a new wife too Lori beth graham she was a preacher as well with a harrowing history of abortion and drug abuse to give her the kind of arc that really sells to the evangelical crowd but her real main qualification in jim's eyes was the fact that she was the spitting image of his ex-wife tammy only she was 17 (laughs) years younger (laughs) exactly and it's worth noting that like his first wife's tammy second wife's Lori. that's not for nothing um (laughs) right there's something going on there yes yes and you know where else there's something going on, Vic? Where's that? The products and services that support this podcast. Oh, let's hear about that. Oh, yeah. Yes. Wow, those were great. Products, pretty good services. Better products and services, I have to say. But <laughs> that's a matter of interpretation. Much like the Bible. 
So, uh, with a stable base of supporters in California, Jim began to tour the nation once more. He built up his time in a cushy minimum security prison for massive fraud into a journey <laughs> through the eye of the needle. <laughs> <laughs> the Washington Post reported on one sermon he gave in Jericho City. He describes the exact moment of his epiphany, a story he calls his day in the pit of hell. Speaking as if in a fugue state, he recalls vague and spooky details. A door open, a madman singing, la, 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 la. At some point, he looked down into the possessed eyes and the door locked behind him. He was either in the insane asylum or in solitary confinement. A man was dying in the next cell. A toilet was overflowing. I had lost the will to live, he tells the crowd. I had slipped into a corner of hell as i was going insane a voice cried out at the split second i was leaving the world it cried jim i love you at first he saw no one then a vision appeared at the door a man with brown skin and brown eyes i didn't know angels are black he says i didn't know (laughs) (laughs) Uh that's his first thought not that there's an angel there but the yeah. color of its skin oh uh-huh, they're black yeah <laughs> oh wow <laughs> didn't call that one right <laughs> fucking amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> amazing that this plays <sighs> Not long after that speech, a wealthy follower swept in and donated $25 million so that Jim and his new wife, Lori, could build a new compound to film their show from. The bakers <laughs> instantly abandoned the flock they'd cultivated in Los Angeles, but they were sure to use the story of those people's generosity to reinforce the narrative of their own awesomeness. During his tour of America, Jim sometimes would regularly refer to his Los Angeles ministry as the inner city. That was how he was supposed to, but he would generally <laughs> slip and just call it the ghetto, saying things like, I found healing in the ghetto. Those people love me so much. Oh my <laughs> God. Those people. Lori also had a number of choice lines in that vein, telling one reporter, This is probably not PC, but out of all the races, white, Hispanic, Afro American, the people of the black race have been by far the kindest to Jim. <laughs> <laughs> out of all the races. <laughs> oh. Uh. A tip from me is, if you're starting a sentence with out of all the races, stop the sentence. <laughs> right. <let's> stop the <laughs> sentence. <laughs> whatever, you're, whatever you're saying, don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Unreal. Mm-hmm. In 2003, the Bakers moved back to the South. A wealthy supporter from Missouri, who claimed Jim had saved his marriage, paid for them to get up and running in the Studio City Cafe in Branson. I love Branson, by the way. It's it's the city where this happens, and and yeah, the, Branson is like it's like it, it is like for for this group of people, like Las Vegas, and like Las Vegas, mm-hmm. like LA's filled with all these like stars who are past their prime, and so they get right. Like that's what yeah, Jim yeah, like Baker's Pat doing. Boone, yeah, yeah, exactly. He's mm-hmm. he's doing his like show in Branson, right. um, and so like they do that for a few years, and eventually they their their backer uses his millions to construct a new compound for them called Morningside, which is basically the same as their old compound but somewhat more modest it is not as big and grand but it includes like a fake main street usa and like basically like it's basically like a weird fake like that chunk of disney world that jim baker yes. creates yeah, for exactly. himself with his recording studio right right it's probably yeah. not as cool not <laughs> at nearly as cool there's probably um, no churros no yeah. churros <laughs> um no definitely not churros so they move in there in 2008, and they've been there ever since. Uh, and it's worth noting that this millionaire backer, Jerry Crawford, actually owns the prop most of the property at Morningside, presumably because Jim Baker can't really own property anymore because no. he still owes millions of dollars in back taxes. Guy. So uh-huh. there's like some sketchy shit. Given his felon status, it's also unlikely that Jim Baker could have convinced the IRS to grant tax-exempt status to another one of his organizations. That is... Probably not going to happen a second time around, right? You know, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, I'm not going to make you tax exempt again. Um, This is probably why he had to discard all of the prosperity gospel nonsense from his first rise to power. He can't ask people to blindly send him money anymore, or at least not the Mm -hmm. same way. Now, I'm not an expert in taxes. But I do know that generally money you receive as a gift is treated very differently from money that you receive in the sale of a product. You don't normally need to pay taxes on a gift, right? Like that's mm. kind of a, a basic rule. Now, stick with me, Vic, because this is where the <laughs> grift gets really complicated. This is okay. this is the pivot that he makes. And it's kind of – it's objectively brilliant. Mm. Um, 
So the main theological shift that Jim Baker undergoes during his prison metamorphosis is to drop the prosperity gospel bullshit and pick up apocalyptic rapture bullshit. And it's the kind of arc that makes narrative sense so people don't question it. You know, like, I thought that it was all about money and all about, like, bringing that in, but then I realized that, like, it's all about God and he's coming back and the world is ending, so wealth doesn't even matter anymore because he can't can't promise people to make them rich by donating money to him anymore. Um, So why would you focus on wealth? So... The question then is, though, why does he start focusing on the apocalypse? What is the grift in the apocalypse? Well, obsessing over the apocalypse allows Jim Baker to hawk an endless line of survival equipment, primarily baker buckets, which are, are dried food storage buckets for preppers. Um, and we'll, t- we'll talk more about those in a minute. Now, selling a shitload of survival equipment would normally mean you have to hand over a lot of that money uh, to the state in taxes, right? Like, that's how a business Mm -hmm. works. But this is not a business. See, if you know Jim Baker, you know that the last motherfucking thing he's ever going to do is pay a goddamn dime in taxes. Um, So he works out a way to not do that. And here's how BuzzFeed describes the grift. In Morningside lingo, these traded supplies or offerings are called love gifts. Technically, the ministry isn't selling these items. Instead, the organization's business model requires that the ministry function on donations, and those donations are a lot easier to get if people get something in return, be it a mug or be it a bucket of food for the apocalypse. So there's no purchasing happening. Wow. Wow. (laughs) A gift to the ministry. It's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) That is such a good grift. Unreal. Real. And it's it's <laughs> this is where you really you really see Jim elevate in my mind to like the ranks of truly great grifters. Because before I feel like he's on easy mode. Like mm. there's there's no artifice in in just saying, give me money, it'll make you rich. This is a ge- legitimately brilliant right. grift. And he's pivot. and he's one that can like adapt so easily. Yeah. And just like find out what the next path is, you know? Mm-hmm. And he's been doing this since like, yeah, 2008. Yeah. Um, so he's, he, and he, you know, Barack Obama was a huge boon to his business. He, he claimed um, almost mm. immediately that Barack Obama was probably the Antichrist um, and the end was nigh. Um, and yeah, and you might think that his boy Trump getting elected would have like actually done some damage to his bottom line um, mm-hmm. because he really supported Donald Trump, but he was able to right. flip almost immediately into uh-huh. freaking out about a black president to freaking out about all the different natural disasters that were going to batter right. the, that were battering the U S um, yeah, and, and then also saying that, you know, if you're against Trump, that's God wanted Trump in there. Then you're, yeah. you're for the devil. You're then saying you the devil appointed the devil. him, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so good. It's just awesome. Um, so, <laughs> In 2015, NPR did a deep dive into his survival buckets, which the prepper community tends to refer to as baker buckets. And they are not well regarded amongst the kinds of people uh, who keep a lot of survival food in their houses. They're not they're not considered good. <laughs> like sawdust. <laughs> yeah, they you you've done so many videos that yeah. are just like focused <laughs> deep pans on like these fucking buckets. Like normal survival food, you'll like you'll like you'll pour out like a little freeze-dried packet of what is basically yeah. and you'll pour in water and you'll stir it together and it's like look you got mac and cheese or whatever right <laughs> baker like fills up like a, like a, like, a 20 like gallon bucket massive tubs of this like <laughs> dried cheese uh cheesy broccoli soup <laughs> they'll just be slowly stirring this like mash of what looks and has to smell like vomit and it's just yeah. they'll, they'll <laughs> stay and- It'll fill his ladle and just eat right from the ladle. (laughs) It's horrifying. Like, like, what kind of church is this? What is this? Like, what is going on? Yeah, the Jim Baker's ads. We'll we'll play some audio from one of them later. His ads for food buckets are. I I find them existentially horrifying. (laughs) Yeah, they are. They are. It's always a clock ticking down. Yeah, (laughs) it's unlike anything else I've ever seen. Uh huh. Um, but I, I want to read first before we drop into one of those videos. I want to read first from a 2015 uh, NPR deep dive on his survival buckets. Quote, among the freeze-dried products available on his website is a 50-day survival food sampler bucket containing 154 meals. It will cost you $135, but the idea is you'll be prepared when food shortages hit. Imagine the world is dying and you're having a breakfast for kings, the end of food for guys. <laughs> we got our hands on a version of this bucket, which contains a variety of hearty dishes, including buttermilk pancakes, vegetable chicken soup, creamy stroganoff, black bean burgers, fettuccine alfredo, and mashed potatoes. In October, 
October, three hour-long segments were devoted to Baker's assertion that we are the generation that will experience rapture. Followers must be prepared to survive and continue preaching the gospel, he says. And why not, as Baker urges, buy food today so that you can have parties when the world's coming apart. <laughs> Save for the pudding, the dishes were extremely salty and had odd, lingering aftertastes. We couldn't agree <laughs> on which was worse, the thick potato soup that felt like eating wet cement, the strong chemical overtones of the chocolate pudding, or the disturbing radioactive orange of the macaroni and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> oh Christ! And Gross. do you have a segment you want to play about the Baker buckets before we move on? Because that's yeah. There's yeah. Like, uh, you talking to me? Like yeah, 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 yeah. There's I mean, there's like the cheesy broccoli rice is yeah, just so uh, like that, offensive to watch, and it's, it's, and, it's and horrible to hear the plops of uh, you know the broccoli <laughs> dropping into the soup. Yeah, it's just like this bright yellow, like neon yellow. It should orange. You should not. No food should be that color. Yeah, it's almost Lovecraftian, and it's yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's unsettlingness, uh-huh. and I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it, you can't see them, so it's it's hard to. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god! Okay, look at this. Look, look at this, boy. What I love put my hands in there, but it's hot this is the cheesy, cheesy broccoli rice look at the broccoli in there oh. wow look at the I broccoli like that's good why wouldn't you want that on the top of a pizza if i went grocery this out would everyone. i would eat right out of this shovel wow Let, let's dump this in with the rice there it goes we're dumping 22 gallons into the rice there it goes wow. into the rice now I have 44 gallons. What if you have to survive for two years or three years? You're going to need some more food. <laughs> but. Oh my. <laughs> and it just looks like, it looks almost like powdered protein. It's just like. Right. <laughs> Like I I I eat a lot of dried food. I go camping. I do like uh-huh. some survival. He's just eating. The- <laughs> it's so That's good. Sick. It's so good. I. <laughs> it's- <laughs> I've never like. No one else sells. I'm very familiar with how people sell survival food. Uh huh. <laughs> no one does this. It, yeah. The the best is uh that he's like he must have had like extra buckets. Yeah. So now he started selling. Buckets filled with Bibles, which is <laughs> insane, <laughs> and it, and they recommend you know burying the Bibles is the bucket for, for when they need it down the line. <laughs> Completely insane. <laughs> <It's> so, unbelievable! <laughs> I don't. It's amazing. It's amazing. He's selling a twenty eight bucket sampler there for twenty five hundred dollars uh, donation or more. PO Box <laughs> Branson, Missouri. Unfucking real, dude. Uh-huh. I, I'll never understand how this works, but it does. No, I don't know. And if Must you have some good lawyers on his side, you know, I, I, I don't even know if anyone's tried. Like, there's mm-hmm. this is just the way the law works, and it shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> right, it should not. Be. <laughs> the, it, you shouldn't just be able to say it's a donation. Here's your product. Uh, right, <laughs> right, but. I guess it's fine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've all agreed not to stop this. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, it's pretty cool and good. <laughs> and I, I have to note, one of the surreal things about watching modern Jim Baker's ads is that he looks like David Cross in a costume. He, de- like, he definitely he, does. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely part of it. He, like, he, you know, emerged from prison and then yeah. he kind of had a... You know, he's, he's wearing a cap now, and he's got this, like, beard. Yeah. Just, yeah, he's, he's like, a, he reinvented himself a little bit, you know, his look. Yeah, you have to when you do this. Yeah. So, Vic, I'm going to start selling buckets <laughs> of slop. <laughs> I mean, no, you taking should. donations. If you donate right. $2,500 to me, I will make sure 44 gallons of something liquid and hot <laughs> arrives right. at your door. I'll I'll find a way. Right. Um, right. So let's <laughs> send the money over, and in the meantime, check out these ads for products that are not donation based and function within the regular economy and have to pay taxes. 
Yeah, Jim Baker wound up on Donald Trump's side of the 2016 election, and his political stances over the last few years won't really surprise anyone. In August, he said this, Hillary Clinton is a very wicked and unchristian woman. She supports gay rights and abortion. I would say she is a bride of Satan. If America elects her, it could lead to Armageddon. Mm. Cool. (laughs) So she would have been so much better of a candidate if she was married to the devil. Like... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> less problematic than bill um right. yeah <laughs> but <laughs> alas initially it looked like trump's election would be bad for jim's business like i said um the whole president hillary means armageddon line i think he was really gearing up for hillary clinton as president because he would have sold mm-hmm. the shit out of food and bible buckets you could have had this whole oh, thing yeah. about like you know they're gonna ban the bible you gotta bury your bibles you gotta bury your uh-huh. food bury it all <laughs> right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the best is like his live feed of the yeah. of the, when the results are coming in. You know, they're just like preparing for Trump to lose and to, and to start their grift again. And yeah, like the same thing with Alex Jones. Yeah, like they, they had to think on their feet quick. Like, yeah. how do how do we get through this now? How do we get through this now? And it was disastrous for Alex mm-hmm. Jones in the oh, end. Yeah. Um, it wasn't disastrous for Jim Baker. Uh, I and I I I don't really know why, other than that, like Alex Jones is. Uh, violent and and uh, uh, commits a ton of crimes, and I I think Jim Baker's been pretty careful about committing crimes since all of the crimes he committed sent him to prison. Mm-hmm. Right. Um. I guess that's, I guess that's just it. Um. And I, I, I at kind of the end of this here, I'm left trying to wonder what Jim's followers see in him. Like when like you like you find and I think most people find these videos from a show so profoundly unsettling that you were you've spent dozens of hours mm-hmm. of your life editing them into the horror shows that they they really are mm-hmm. to try to like highlight that because I, I'm gonna guess can you can you can you tell me about the first time you ever came across one of these videos like what it was like realizing this was all going on there had to be a time like, before you knew yeah, Jim Baker well, was doing this yeah I mean I thought I came across the um the the Baker bucket like when he was making the cheesy brack of the rice and the massive tubs um uh <laughs> my friend uh, Tim Heidecker found it he said you got to do something with this because like, it seems like it's like it's like a skit or something. It just doesn't seem real, you know. And like I, I don't know what's up with the people that that I, I don't know how anybody can just watch that and not like be offended. Like wow, like why is this happening? How why would you give this guy any money? But um, I think I think it's a lot of because he still has a lot of older people that you know grew yep. up with him in the seventies and eighties, and and he's this cu- cultural icon in a way. Um, and you know, it's, there's a little bit of the cult mentality too there. Cause like even you can actually like buy rooms in his studio. Yeah. So you can yeah, people be like live there, they live in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> so like all what? old ladies yeah. pretty much. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. But I've noticed recently, well, even before the coronavirus outbreak, uh, like the, the, the crowd has been pretty slim. It's been yeah. like, they've been trying to fill the, uh, the rows with like statues and stuff to make it, you know, fill the room up a little bit. But yeah, I'd be curious to know how they're doing. Yeah. They're, um, it's interesting. They're, uh, so this is like, you do have to say it's his, his current digs are much more, um, much less ambitious than his original ones. And like, I think his studio mm-hmm. has about a 60, uh, seat audience. Oh um, yeah. If and, that, yeah. yeah they're they're kind of all older women and yeah, it does seem mm-hmm. like they, there have been less of them lately for right. obvious reasons. Um, yeah. But he did. Uh, he did slip with the uh, with pushing uh, the silver solution. Yeah, he did. did he, he got in yeah. trouble for that. He's yeah. He's being sued by uh, like the a- Missouri a- AG. I think. Yeah, I think New York mm-hmm. too. Like yeah, so and New we'll, York. Yeah, we'll see what kind of damage that does. It's interesting because I think he kind of backed off on the silver stuff once he got mm-hmm. sued. I may be a little wrong on that, but no, I did. know. Oh yeah, I know Alex mm. did not. Alex Jones oh. <laughs> has just been like, I think he's just kind of being like, "Fuck it, let's see what they do." Yeah, what are you gonna do? Yeah, yeah, yeah come, come and get me. And like, yeah, Jim Baker's whole life is a testament to the fact that like they don't do that much. Like, yeah, you have to commit tens of millions of dollars in fraud and violent rape, and like the rape didn't have any impact on his sentencing because he wasn't charged for it. But I do think right. it kind of played into the fact that like something happened to him. Like, I mm-hmm. think if he just committed financial crimes, I doubt he would have spent more than like a year in prison. But, mm-hmm. um. Yeah, it's quite a 
quite a thing. Anyway, I, I wanted to kind of end by trying to get into the heads a little bit of the people who watch this and love this and find him inspiring, because I will never really understand them, but we should try to a little bit, because mm-hmm. it's important. Um, so I found a BuzzFeed article um, that that interviews uh, a woman who's a big fan of Jim Baker's, uh, an, a, an older lady named uh, Days Green is her, her last name. Um, quote, I watch the show because I can connect with Jim and Lori. They seem to be such everyday people, she says. The stuff they talk... <laughs> <laughs> right Just away, I'm like, I, yeah, yeah, like, who do right, you know? There, like, what? <laughs> I, I grew up in the South. I know the rural parts of this country. I don't know anyone like Jim Baker. Right. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> Jesus, the stuff they talk about the show, it's stuff that we everyday people struggle with. And I guess that part is true because they do talk very, mm, you know, candidly sure. about that. It's helped me to be a better person. So that part I get. Um, Days Green is worried about many things. The Leviathan spirit, natural disasters, <laughs> pestilence, bird flu, swine flu, Palestine, the second coming of Christ, <laughs> ISIS, blasphemy and immigration. Just the amazing list of like, yeah, you should be worried about, you know, diseases and natural diseases. Palestine. <laughs> Wait, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Immigration. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> Over the course of our conversation, she expresses fear that the world is crumbling before her, that people are falling further and further away from God. I am awake, Days Green says. People say that I am crazy, but I am not crazy. Jim Baker is not crazy. We know that something is happening, and we are trying to do something. (sighs) Mostly, Days Green says she has been called crazy by the church she used to attend. She asked the church to preach on the book of Revelation to reveal the truth of the Bible that she believes people need to know because it's happening now. She uses a verse from Hebrews 5.12 in our conversation, which chastises young Christians for their dependence on easily digested topics of faith instead of trying to tackle more meaty ones. Revelation, in her opinion, is the meat. I guess I got thrown into the fanatical group, she says, because her church asked her to leave. Days Green's faith is tightly bound together with her politics. She says she is a Donald Trump supporter. She wants the swamp in Washington, D.C. cleared out, and she wants America to return to the America she lived in during her childhood. Mm. There's a lot of it there, and that's why Main Street USA is the theme of his current, like, compound Mm -hmm. sort of church thing. Yeah, they want to go back in time, and they're very open about that. Um, I'm continuing the article because I think this is important. Her biggest personal cause is immigration. She wants her governor, Greg Abbott, to get rid of the sanctuary cities in Texas. In fact, Abbott recently signed legislation banning them. It used to be a little shelf in the grocery store that had a few little Mexican things on it. But now there's a whole (laughs) section of the store that's written in Spanish, she explains. They are supposed to assimilate. It went from like five Mexican families to like uh, around us to like 20. There are Muslim people living in Graham, a nearby town. They took over the convenience stores. She pauses. I don't want to have to physically fight those people here on our own homeland for our christian american values but i will they're an invading force i feel there you go (laughs) yeah god yeah and it's that's it's um, yeah that's what that's that's something though i mean because he doesn't i think he does have like muslim guests on his show you know, I th- I think he. I, mean, I could be wrong. But yeah, I, I yeah I, I don't know I, enough about that, but that's at least what yeah. this lady takes. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild, and the the language that Baker used around Donald Trump is pretty wild. Um, mm-hmm. like in the run up to like during the election, he said uh, at one point, "I'm not supposed to tell you this, but I have eyewitnesses. Donald Trump is a very tender man, and he weeps. He wants to please God more than anything else. He wants to be president of the United States and make things right in this country because he loves God Almighty." Then, with his eyes shining, Baker declared, "God has called, I believe, Donald Trump." So, yeah. And yeah. <laughs> Baker says Trump called him to thank him after his election, uh, and and they were invited to the inauguration, which they attended. They were invited to the, the inaugural yep. prayer breakfast and inaugural ball. Uh, so, yeah, that's... Yeah, you get this guy walking around the White yeah. House. That's uh, normal, typical stuff. Yeah, this is good. Good. No, it's good. Good, it's good for America. Good for America. <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of the rapists in the White House, he's... <laughs> one of them yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah he's, he is among them he's on the list yeah. yep. <laughs> um yep that's our episode Nick. uplifting <laughs> yeah yeah how's really? everybody feeling <laughs> oh my god i need a bath <laughs> yeah a bath in one of those giant <laughs> buckets full of cheesy broccoli right. <laughs> exactly yeah. oh uh, my christ uh 
Oh. So, how um, <laughs> how we doing? <laughs> doing all right. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yep. Yep. Robert. Mm-hmm. You're frozen. I I know. Yeah. We're all frozen. Yeah. Frozen. Frozen yes. in <laughs> awe of the grifting <laughs> talent right. of Jim Baker. That's what it is. Fucking incredible. <laughs> Uh, well, Vic, you want to plug your pluggables? Do you sell sure. gigantic 44-gallon buckets of slop? I don't at the moment, That's, but I'm working on it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. If gonna, you going to get my uh, dusty food together <laughs> and you mix it with a little water and you can uh, you can feed your family. The good uh, so, yeah. as a general rule, the good dried food like that you open the packs and you can tell it's food, right? It looks like freeze dried uh-huh. and like shrunken and, you know, desiccated, but it, it looks like what it is. And like some of it, you yeah, can actually just eat yeah. dry and it's not bad. Like mountain house, you can eat that shit dry and it, it's pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. Baker's food. Yeah. It just looks like sawdust. <laughs> it is. Yeah. yeah. It's a slop. It's like, yeah, a pig should be eating it. <laughs> I don't know how he's put a trough yeah, out there. And yeah. that's fucking incredible. Um, right. Right. Fucking but, uh, incredible. Oh, yeah, but you can, uh, if you want to see my uh, re-edits of uh, Jim Baker videos, you can uh, head to my YouTube, Vic Berger. Uh, there's a number of them on there. There's a lot of a lot of stuff there, a lot of, a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> uh, you can, yeah, check me out on Twitter, Facebook, type in Vic Berger, and there I am. Yeah, yeah. there he is. Mm-hmm. And I am also on the internet. He's I I write okay on Twitter. We're at Bastards Pod on Twitter and Instagram. We have a T Public store where you can buy merch. Robert also hosts a podcast called The Women's War. You should check it out. And I haven't verified any of this information, so check up on it on your own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what he said. Oh, and thanks, thanks for what you guys do. You guys yeah. are doing important work <laughs> documenting all this. Seriously, thank, <laughs> thank you as well. Please, um, mm-hmm. please continue doing. I don't really know how to describe what you do, but it's important. Um, it, it, <laughs> it, it's important documentation. I consider it a form of journalism, Vic, and I'll tell you why. Oh, wow. It, it's because the, the, the actual, the baseline reality of these, these videos doesn't do enough to convey emotionally what happens to a human being who watches them in the time in which they're concurrent. And I, I think what you do uh, provides that by by setting the tone. <laughs> that is important. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, because I mean, because Jim is like he's doing, you know, five, six hours a week. He's like, you know, these shows are long. And uh, so, yeah, if, I, I try to whittle it down to uh, the most horrifying moments. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty cool and good. <laughs> so awesome. um, we're all going to go wash our hands. Wash our hands, cry, <laughs> pray, maybe. I don't know. Pray, <laughs> pray about crying, cry about right, prayer. Pray. <laughs> yeah, right. it's gonna be, yeah. it's gonna be good. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, thanks for having thanks me. Thanks for guys. being awesome. on, Vic.